and Ukraine's forces are calling on self-defence units in Sovyansk to surrender and lay down their weapons in return for safety. Well, we did have a chance to speak to some of the locals there and they are determined to stand firm in the face of the Ukrainian army's operation. I used to be in the military, but I've never raised arms against civilians. They cry, oh, democracy, democracy, we live in a democratic country. But in reality, explain to me, where is it? We don't even have the right to speak out. They don't care about the Southeast. They decided to work things out without us, to choose a president without us. We're standing for the right cause, and we don't want to fight anyone. We simply want to live in a civilized state where everyone's rights are respected, and we don't want the Kiev junta to rule. Yanukovych did not send forces to Maidan Square, but these sent theirs. And they did it quietly at four in the morning, just like fascists. I won't move an inch from here. Let the tanks crush me, but I won't move. Why? My home is here. My family, my friends and their children are here. Why should I leave my city because of them? I didn't start a war with them. It's they who sent an army here. It's just impossible to live like this anymore. Tell me, what country is sending armed forces against its own people? We have people being killed here. Public transport's not working. Food is not making its way into the city. All mothers are sitting and trembling and are asking for help. Meanwhile, President Obama has complimented Ukraine's interim government for showing outstanding restraint when it comes to quelling the protests in the east of the country. The remarks were made during a joint press conference with Germany's Angela Merkel. RT's Gianni Chikian has more now on the Western reaction to what's happening in Ukraine. After what we've, uh, we've been hearing, I mean, grave situation in Ukraine is Odessa. So you had pro-Kiev radicals attacking anti-Kiev activists who had set up a camp in the central square and some had barricaded themselves inside the trade union's house. We know that a pro-Kiev radical group has set the building on fire and scores died inside, having either suffocated to death or jumped out of the burning building. And despite all this, we hear no denunciation of this kind of violence coming from U.S. officials. They have firmly sided themselves with authorities in Kiev. And Everyone in Ukraine who opposes the government in Kiev, in the view of Washington, just receives their instructions from Moscow. President Obama earlier met with Ger German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who's here in Washington, and he showed support for Kiev's crackdown on the protests in the east of Ukraine. He called it a move to restore order. From President Obama, we heard nothing but praise for the government in Kiev. One of the biggest concerns that we've seen is uh, the Russian propaganda that has been uh, blasted out nonstop suggesting somehow that the Ukrainian government uh, is responsible for the problems in eastern Ukraine. The Ukrainian government has shown remarkable restraint throughout this process. At one point, he even called the interim authorities in Kiev the duly elected government, apparently skipping the fact that Ukraine's elected president was overthrown and the Ukrainians have not yet had the chance to elect their government. Again, the U.S. president dismissed the whole protest in the east as sponsored and controlled by Russia and put the responsibility for de-escalation on Moscow alone. President Obama, together with Angela Merkel, threatened Russia with a new round of sanctions, this time sectoral sanctions. There has been a lot of talk about energy and how to diversify Europe's energy supplies. The U.S. president was happy to announce that the U.S. has approved the export of U.S. natural gas. He said the trade agreement that the U.S. and Europe are now negotiating will make energy cooperation easier. So it's good news for Euro U.S. energy companies. But um, obviously this all happening as the situation further de-escalates in Ukraine. And Western officials seem to be keen to dismiss the violence carried out by pro-Kiev forces. Of course, we are following events in Ukraine very closely. I'll be back with more updates uh, in a couple of minutes. We will stand for Europe, the white Europe, the traditional Europe, for the free nation Europe. They should be arresting all those terrorists in Kiev instead. All of the presidential candidates, the military junta, the Nazis who gave orders to kill their own people. Just because their culture and their views are different.
We're all Slavs. We have to live in peace. We're brothers. We shouldn't fight each other. We're one people. We're all brothers. Hello again. Now, the fate of Ukraine and its eastern regions has been debated at an emergency session of the UN Security Council. RT's Anastasia Chorkina is in New York with more. Two-hour meeting, a second one conducted this week, a 13th meeting on the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, this Friday, it was called by Russia, an urgent session to discuss the latest unraveling chaos on the ground. Of course, uh, traditional for now in this crisis, blame game continued between the United States and West and Russia. Certainly, the U.S. continues to blame Russia for events unraveling on the ground, blaming it for trying to allegedly get in the way of Ukraine's sovereignty. Russia, however, said it called for this meeting today, urgent Urgently, because of the increased militarization by the Kiev government against its own people. Russia has said that these are very dangerous steps that could lead to harsh consequences and called it a criminal misadventure, the latest events that have been unraveling in eastern Ukraine. Take a listen to Russia's ambassador to the UN. We call on Kiev, as well as those who signed the Geneva Agreement, the US and the EU, not to make horrible mistakes and soberly assess the possible outcome of their actions. We demand the West to reject its destructive policy with respect to Ukraine. We also demand those who took power in Kiev to immediately stop their punishing operation and any other violence against their own people, to free political prisoners and allow all freedoms for journalists. Russia has also said that it's time for the West to stop toying with the situation in Ukraine and talk to people in Kiev instead of telling continuously Russia to wear and how to have its own troops on its own territory. Of course, uh, a back and forth ensued between the U.S. and Russia, and the meeting did end with Russia calling for all sides and the international community to uh, try to continue to stick with the agreement to halt all violence on the ground. Let's go back to our breaking news story, the deadly standoff in Ukraine that has now spread to the country's south. There have been dozens of fatalities and scores of injured people in the port city of Odessa, which had been relatively peaceful following February's coup in Kiev. Um, these are pictures we received from the local TV stations there of the trade unions building where most of the supporters of greater autonomy uh, were f have been forced out after trying to seek shelter there. However, the standoff is still continuing with a group of about 50 anti-Kiev protesters reportedly trapped on the roof. A thousand strong mob has, uh, has had the building under siege. More than 30 people have been killed, according to police, and some of the victims died after jumping out of the windows, according to witnesses. More people then choked to death on smoke after the building was set on fire. Others were shot. Uh, scores of injured people have also been lying in the streets crying for help, and at the same time, masked men in black clothes have been seen threatening people on the streets with machine guns. The attackers are mostly football ultras, we are led to believe, joined by members of far-right groups. Meanwhile, the EU says it's watching Ukraine's military action in the east with, quote, growing concern, but critics say Europe hasn't been living up to its own standards. If you look at uh, other cases when uh, heavy equipment and military forces are used against uh, civilian protests all over the world, European Union stands in defense of uh, human rights and uh, defense of, uh, in defense of, uh, in support of peaceful resolution of any of that conflict. In this particular case, uh, the level of uh, double standards and the level of uh, the support of the key official figures of European Union for the American uh, version of uh, the uh, events in uh, eastern Ukraine. Uh, we have to ask uh, several members of uh, American political elites uh, what uh, do they want to achieve now, because what they are actually achieving now by suppressing militarily, uh, suppressing of, uh, of the protest in the southeast of Ukraine, particularly in Slavyansk, is that uh, they will achieve uh, the situation in which 
uh, there will be no more possibility, even the slightest possibility, for uh, united Ukraine. Well, several cities in eastern and southern Ukraine are being swept by deadly violence. Among the latest flashpoints are the cities of Kramatorsk, Slavyansk and, as we just mentioned, the port city of Odessa. Uh, to talk more about these developments, we're joined now uh, live by geopolitical analyst Eric Dreitzer. Uh, Mr. Drake, so thank you very much for coming on to the program. Um, now, the most recent report suggests that the Ukrainian National Guard has stormed the city of Kramatorsk this evening. I mean, this is a very serious downward spiral, isn't it, that we're uh, seeing right now? Well, that's absolutely correct, and I think that it should be understood as the necessary outgrowth, really the product of many of the policies that have been promoted and pushed by the United States and the Western powers that have been backing the junta that seized power illegally in Kiev. And I would just point to some of the specific policies, such as the uh, refusal to disarm the right sector and other ultra-nationalist uh, right, uh, right-wing militias, the refusal not only to disarm them, but to actually actually then integrate them into the forces at the disposal of Kiev. I think that is one of the principal reasons, one of the principal uh, factors that precipitated a lot of the events that we're seeing now. For instance, what you've seen in Odessa over the course of the last few hours and really the last 24 hours or so is, I think, an outgrowth of precisely that. This was not a pure military operation. This was a fascist style assault upon innocent civilians in that city who had taken refuge in that building. And I think that it should be made very clear that this is part of the policy that Kiev and its backers in Washington have been promoting now for months. And given the deadly events that we've all seen now uh, over the last 24 hours or so, do you think the U.S. will actually change its tune? I mean, just this afternoon in America, President Barack Obama was saying he admired the restraint that the interim government had shown. Well, no, certainly Washington's not going to be changing its policy. For one, they're too busy uh, attacking Russian media and putting out the State Department's talking points. On the other hand, most specifically, and I think most concretely and most dangerously, is the fact that the United States has painted itself into a diplomatic and a geopolitical corner. There is no going back to the pre-February 21st period. At this point, there's no going back to the pre-April 17th period. The uh, Geneva uh, statement, which I should point out was not an agreement, but a statement that was jointly uh, issued by the participants in Geneva that called for the disarming of all of the militia forces, all paramilitaries and all armed protesters, which included those backed by Kiev. That is now out the window as well, as we've seen with a number of other agreements that the United States and its European partners have signed on to. This is what you call a destabilization, a destabilization of Ukraine for geopolitical political gain. Unfortunately for Russia, for Ukraine and for the world, this is one of the great political blunders of recent decades. OK, we do have to leave it there. We've run out of time, but uh, grateful for your insight. That's uh, Eric Dreitzer, uh, geopolitical analyst. Thank you. Live from the US. Coming up after the break, we have a documentary about the events in southeast Ukraine. You are watching RT International.